Okay, perfect. Yeah, so first of all, um, it's an honor to be here. And I, I, would, I would like to uh, thank um, everyone in this uh, session. Also, Angela Dai, I really appreciate the work. I really like how um, you know nowadays uh, we're getting to a level of refinement that is actually user controlled in um, in in well generative uh, AI in general, right? Like the one of the strongest artist tools that you can imagine is actually being able to control latent space properly. This this direction of work is super important. It's going to be um, very relevant um, very soon, right? So my talk is. Um, my talk is focusing less on um, on uh, applications of computer vision in particular, but more how to use these applications uh, in a system. Right, so it's more of a systems talk, and uh, I can I can break down the words of uh, of what I mean here by by saying like hyperscale spatial computing. Uh, first of all, I'll start with spatial computing. That's the easy part. I'm 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 using spatial computing as my um, as my uh, term rather than XR or VR, AR, just because um, I think and everything that, that we talk about can be applied to every uh, human uh, interfacing computer or rather every body attached computer, right? So anything that's around your body, um, there's a certain restriction uh, of that thing that's that's around your body and it's almost metabolic, right? Uh, that, that thing needs to have a certain amount of power. Uh, it needs to have a certain um, uh, a certain amount of compute associated with it, but, but also like it can't have a battery, it can't heat up too much. Um, so, so it has like a, a low restriction, like a, a lower bound, and it has an upper bound, um, right? So in, in this talk, I wanna convince you of a few things in general. Um, first of all, that it no longer makes sense to consider, hang on, sorry. I want to convince you that it no longer makes sense to consider um, uh, spatial computing like an engines um, as separate from your machine, right? So, so like the the, the cloud computing uh, part of spatial computing uh, is pretty much like in a continuum with your machine, right? And the second thing I want to convince you of is that the next five years in spatial computing, if you're doing any kind of systems research, is associated mostly with uh, latency and jitter, right? And this applies to all kinds of, of deep learning uh, approaches. And as a corollary that our engine, right? The, the thing that we're, that we're um, using in order to, to, to do spatial computing is uh, now the, well, the web, right? It's the cloud. Um, and with that, uh, I, wanna, I wanna start by breaking down a little bit what, um, uh, what, what we're talking about. And if you'll excuse me, I just need to move uh, my speaker notes because the the Zoom, yeah, okay, there we go. The Zoom was hiding my, my speaker notes. Okay, so um, let's talk about, uh, about bandwidth, latency, and power, right? And modern uh, graphics architecture is dictated by, by these things, basically. Um, and if you look at VR headsets, which is a very popular topic today, um, what we're what we're seeing is that the GPU used to be the widest point in the pipeline, right? Like the, that's that's the um, the bandwidth funnel that I'm talking about. It used to, to expand towards the end. And I'll I'll demonstrate that in a second. Um, so GPU used to be the widest point, but now we're getting to the point that we want to do more things, uh, and we have uh, power limitations, and we also have compute limitations, right? And so when you're when you're thinking about uh, game engines in general, let, let's actually let's actually just revisit the topic of game engines. Let's talk about what a game engine is, um, and talk about why why we're you know we're fixated so much in in trying to make these things better. Um, so a place to start is just let's let's define what what a simulation engine does. Right, so it's a looping process mostly. Um, it gathers some inputs in the beginning. It then uh, executes uh, some simulation graph. Uh, runs maybe it runs some game scripts for it, but and then it executes some render graph at the end. And there's also some data preparations things in between, right? So like you you need to pack your data up to to, to render. And by the way, I'm not showing any particular engine. I'm showing pretty much the industry consensus of what what a simulation engine is today when run on a single machine. 
Uh, and the thing is, these these are optimized against metric, right? So, so um, if you have a desktop computer or a console, you'll see that most conferences that are talking about game development, uh, they'll talk about things like uh, maximizing resource use, right? So, so you need to like peg all the CPUs, peg all the GPU cores, um, make sure that that everything is running all at the same time, so you, you can do uh, the maximum amount of draws or the maximum amount of physics. You know, you, we're, we're we're trying to get like maximum experience. Um, but if you're designing for mobile or you know for like for a VR headset that's that's uh, mobile, um, you have a slightly different goal. You wanna um, you wanna enable a stable experience, right? You don't you don't want to cause people to vomit, um, and you also want to do this uh, with with uh, minimizing power draw, right? So so the, that's the that's where the other sort of metabolic uh, part of 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 compute comes in. You you need to have something that is reliable over time. Um, and as a result, it's also optimized for a target hardware. So, you know, like it needs to know the amount of operations um, exist in a simulation loop. In, in fact, if you if you have an unknown size of operation, um, the lead engineer will be angry at you because, because it will lead to some frame drops, right? You need to hit a certain amount of time in a simulation. Otherwise, um, the user just doesn't get a frame. Um, and there's also, because of that, there's a low flexibility in the data layout. You, we need to arrange the data in a, in a certain way that en enables us to move it around and use it for multiple things. And as a result, you can see, for example, if you're running a physics uh, simulation and you're running animations, they're often using different pieces of data because the data is laid out in different ways. They can't, they can't use the same thing. So often animations will influence physics and they'll have to run sequentially um, and, and they'll have to sort of like convert in order to speak to each other, right? And but let's let's look at it in a different way. Let's just let's just talk about timing for a second. So typically, um, the way people consider, uh, you know, generally the, the way people consider the the motion to photon part, like the part the part that that actually uh, conducts any form of of engineering uh, <laughs> things that can be modified by engineering. Um, those that happens somewhere between the sensor and the photons, right? So, so we, we go center, sensor to CPU, then CPU to GPU, then GPU to device, then device to photons. Uh, but this is not the complete picture in my mind, right? I want to add two more pieces that I think are very relevant, um, and and there, that that's brain to motion and photons to brain. And overall, when we think about the latency uh, that is over here, right, like that, that's this is a typical latency for a headset. Um, we talk about like something like five seconds to collect all the all the motion, then then there's a few pipeline frames until it hits hits photons. That's a fairly small number. It's like 38 milliseconds, or you know, 36 milliseconds, or something. Yeah, 38 in this case. Um, but what you should actually be looking at is where the human comes in in the loop, right? And uh, you know, the brain to motion part is is the part where I say, well, the motor cortex up until we have a motion, and the photons to brain part. That's where you know, like photons hit the eye, they go through V1 until our brain is make able to make a conscious decision and then transfer it to the motor cortex, right? So we have a loop that is, let's say, just under 300 milliseconds for for like a VR simulation. That's what's really happening. Um, and and this is you know this is the sort of stuff that that's been enabled so we can do um, you know play video games and hang out uh, with each other in a fairly simple world and it kind of looks like this right like in in terms of bandwidth this is this bandwidth is obviously not to scale but this is illustrative if, if we had any kind of server and the server was sending stuff uh, it was kind of negligible and most of the work was happening by you know moving things in the, the CPU the CPU expanded the bandwidth a bit and then all of the parallel stuff. You know, all of the stuff that we, you know, the state of the art of computing that did all the work happened towards the end, right? This is the, the very last part of, of getting a compute to a user happened on the edge device. Uh, and as we said, the thing that is moving to like a metabolically limited thing. Um, so that, that all happened over here. And obviously, um, by the way, this, uh, this calculation is a bit naive. We do, really don't want a motion to photon latency of 38 milliseconds. So we do all sorts of optimizations. Oculus do a bunch like, like uh, time warp and space warp. Generally late warping is, is what we should call it. But this is generally a good view of what the problem is, right? But um, while this led us to a bunch of things, um, someone, uh, I, I spoke to, to Greg Bornstein who invented the Minority Report UI and he works at Riot Games now. Um, 
And he he jokingly said, "There's only one problem to be solved in VR, and what it's what what people want to do in VR, and we don't actually know." Right. So, uh, you know, like there's a bunch of things that we've proven successful. For example, personal games. Great. You know, I play Beat Saber a lot. Um, training and education, obviously. Um, and there are some things that are now beginning to be constrained somehow. Right. So presence and social is constrained by latency. Um, immersion is obviously constrained in all sorts of ways. Um, and if you want to work on large data sets, um, that's also generally pretty constrained. And this is why at NVIDIA, you know, you heard earlier that we talked about Omniverse. This is why we invented Omniverse. So I don't really need to pitch this to you again, but basically the idea is that everyone in video games and film, up until now they enjoyed a graphics pipeline, but nobody else, like you know, CAD industry, Salisbury card industry, nobody else enjoyed a graphics pipeline. So everyone was doing work pretty much in isolation. And um, we want to connect all these applications. We also think that, you know, just in, the, in terms of the future of work, these applications all matter. So we needed a way to connect them, right? And so we chose uh, Pixar's USD format, as you heard earlier today from Michael Cass, um, to connect all these things. And USD doesn't allow just, you know, connecting the pieces of data together. It also allows connecting a rendering interface, Hydra, uh, which we, we're using extensively. And the problems we're solving with this, I'm going to go fast in this part just because we want to get to the meat of the problem. Um, so the problems we're, so we're solving here are, you know, we have multiple user sites and that causes latency, obviously, because the speed of light is not, you know, it's, it's not infinite. Um, and, and all these places contain data that isn't really easy to move around. Um, so, you know, we need to think about the problem now is like we need to redefine the engine. The engine can't really be static if it needs to do all these things. It re really can't sit at the edge um, of a, or, you know, at the headset or at one desktop. It needs to do a little more things. And, you know, I was looking for a quote to put here. And this morning I heard a quote from someone named Philip Rosedale. He said, um, every new user scripting capability that we added into the Second Life system caused the frame rate to drop to zero. You all heard it. It was this morning that he said that. Um, and that, that means something, right? Whenever you, like researchers are adding uh, code into, into an engine, um, they need to do a lot of work to make it run in real time. Um, and that's not often resources that they have. So what we have right now is engines that run at like a predictable scale and, you know, they have these arbitrary limitations and they also have a fixed rendering path per frame. But what we really need is stuff that, you know, maybe uh, runs 10,000 NPCs or maybe runs physics and weather and water sims. And all of these need to run at gigantic scales or maybe they want to use NERF uh, or, you know, any other kind of rendering engine. So we had to build a more complex system that connects all these things together, right? And this is why we, we built it's Omniverse. Um, so we have this server in the middle, which obviously uh, uh, takes, uh, you know, listens to a bunch of transactions from, from different DCC tools. They're all speaking universal scene description, as you heard this morning from Michael Cass. Um, and then there's a bunch of services, right? And these are what I would call engine components. There's a bunch of services that run on this data and, and do stuff with it. Right, so uh, you know we can have uh, live edit services. We can have physics services. In fact, let's actually just look at physics services for a second. The, all of these things are not things that you could do on a small, you know, let's let's say metabolically limited edge computer nowadays. Right, you need to have a special simulator that runs elsewhere. And um, as you can tell, this is not a simple uh, problem. Right, like these these are. These are running pretty high intensity um, pieces of simulation themselves, and they need to communicate all these high intensity pieces of simulation around. So we need obviously a better server infrastructure to support that. So this is why the definition of hyperscale, that's the last word, that's the last piece that I'm, uh, I need to define over here. That's, um, this is where this definition arises. We have a different type of cloud computing now where the majority of the application is actually kind of you know, latency critical. So it lives in a data center. Uh, it's talking to other pieces in the data center. Those other pieces are responding not only quickly, not only in a predictable manner, uh, but also with a lot of data. Right. And so we needed to develop not just NVIDIA, but us as an industry needed to develop other ways of dealing with that. So, um, you know, one of the ways is wide bandwidth CPUs, which, uh, you know, obviously triggered the, the transition from um, Intel based C uh, CPUs, or sorry, x86 based CPUs to, to, um, to ARM based CPUs, but generally, you know, opening up paths. But, but that's not enough because uh, bandwidth is gigantic, right? So, so it's just CPUs can't just do this work. So we have to have some other processors. Um, 
one of the other processors less known is called a data processing unit. And that's something that uh, basically offloads work from what a CPU would normally do uh, and um, operates, does some fixed function things um, to, uh, to packets, right? So it's, it sits close to a network and it does things like pick up packets and move them directly to GPUs. Or maybe it just does some of the internet traffic or you know the, the inside data center traffic itself, right? So these are different structures and different frames of thinking of these things. Um, and building this is also uh, a whole new game, right? So, so as we understand, we have more bandwidth because we have all these gigantic servers that do things. Uh, so we can fan out multiple services, we can run pretty much you know, every, every piece of, um, of computer vision that has been shown today, uh, we should be able to support. This is our mission, right? We, we, we'd be embarrassed if we can't. Um, but uh, also this means that, that we have more latency. So uh, you know, like not only is our pipeline to the users longer because it's in the data center, um, but we also add individual latency sites. And uh, more embarrassingly, we also add jitter sources, right? So uh, uh, if your packet doesn't arrive at a predictable time, um, then, then you don't get predictable frame times. And uh, the user is going to eventually, hey, Bumped, uh, right? That's that's what happens. Um, you, you know, if you if you don't see a consistent vision of reality um, as you're expecting, uh, what happens typically is you think you've been poisoned. This is your body just tells you that. Um, so optimizing this happens in sort of two fronts, right? We need we need better ideas on how to deal with latency and jitter, and we also need better prediction. We need to avoid work and we need to make the work faster. And we're all gambling on one or the other. And I, I was I was looking for a way to illustrate this, and I. I um, made this illustration, which is the best, the best thing I can think about when we're talking about uh, building a hyperscale system. We're all either betting, betting on the speed of light being fast enough, um, or uh, you know, like we're, we're gambling on, on the fact that we can transfer enough, right? And, and it's either the laws of physics win or information theory wins, um, and typically they race against each other, and we have to, well, we have to fight them, right? And so um, when we're looking at what it actually looks like to do um, a you know a network wide uh, solution. Let's let's imagine a scenario where we have a ping time of forty milliseconds, right? So we have forty milliseconds, and uh, and with the things that we added over here are um, some some embedded device. Let's say it's a it's a VR headset, uh, and it's talking to the network. Let's say over five G or something, um, and then uh, the network is responding. So these are the bits that we added, and then in order to add to that, we just uh, you know smash to the device together. So uh, this part of the pipeline is a little longer. It takes 22 milliseconds, which is realistic uh, time for you know, like running a codec that expands um, the the, um, the the network traffic and and uh, allows allows to you know to, sh to show video on the device. Uh, but the thing is, we also added jitter sources, and these jitter sources are uh, you know like are they 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 need to be dealt with. Um, and the bandwidth here is obviously the opposite, right? The server is doing most of the work and the device is doing very little, but the network is load bearing in this case, right? But the thing is we also recently discovered, discovered, invented, um, or rather released um, a way to, to do very different kinds of rendering. We, we now do real-time ray tracing. Real-time ray tracing allows us to both create very, very realistic images, but also you know, we have some flexibility in how the data is represented because Ray tracing allows us to have images um, uh, in uh, generate images from from vast amounts of geometry, and the, it allows us to do that because uh, ray tracing is is basically log n of geometry uh, sensitive, right? So you can uh, put as many geometry as much geometry as you want as long as it fits in VRAM. Um, and and the complexity isn't at the geometry; it's at the amount of rays being shot. And over here, you can see um, the VR framework that we're currently building uh, that is doing uh, ray traced uh, VR. And I, I believe this is the world's first ray traced VR editor. Uh, that's what my team is building. Um, so over here, you can see we have real reflections uh, in this thing, and. Um, Real reflections are actually really important for immersion because um, your, your body generally wants to have like ego vection, its own ego motion. 
uh, matching with uh, with the perspective, but it also has soft shadows. Soft shadows are really useful because you know you, you generally know how big you are and you generally understand lights. Um, so soft shadows help you understand how big something that you're looking at is. Um, but it also has some productivity gains because it's connected to Omniverse, so you can basically be editing gigantic models on the server in real time with this, right? So all the things that you're looking at over here that we're doing are all, you know, um, th those are all production assets. Um, so I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip this as well. And um, we need to find a way to optimize all of that. So obviously, you know, uh, VR is generally a game of optimization. Um, there's there's a lot of optimizations that we have in, on, under the hood. One of the most interesting ones is because we're doing ray tracing, we can make a continuous version of a foveated rendering, right? We don't need to have separate buffers. We can just schedule rays that you know expand on a very large um, a very large portion of of the world, and we can just make sparser rays towards the edges of the image. Sparser rays towards the edges of the image means that you render less pixels there, and then uh, you result in a 30% size image compared to the one that you would normally have. So what what should we do with all this extra bandwidth? I mean, this is this is really helpful, but I don't think that's a good question. A better question is what do we want to do in VR that we haven't done so far? And one of the things that we want to do first is um, you know like we want to do uh, much better navigation inside a room. So, you know, redirected walking has been a, fill, a field in VR uh, that has been researched for a long time, but I haven't seen it deployed actually anywhere. What it does is it sort of uh, gives you some cues to move your head um, around. So, oh, sorry, to move your body around without noticing really. Um, so you can uh, not hit walls and not be um, ejected from immersion by being told, hey, this is a wall, right? And this is actually research that, that this is a paper that I participated in uh, from a bunch of years ago. Uh, it was SIGGRAPH 2018. Um, so, so this is one of the things that, that is currently hard to do on simply a headset. And that's because path planning is actually a really expensive thing. Uh, you know, state of the art sometimes takes three seconds in complex scenes, especially when other users are moving. Um, but you also want to do stuff like, uh, you know, assisted perception, which means you want to be able to look where other people um, uh, uh, sorry, look where you would normally not look. And that's uh, research done by Anka Dragan's group um, uh, that allows people to see what they are normally biased against seeing. Um, so, you know, VR is, a, is an assistive technology, uh, allows you to do this. But also you want to generate some salience, some salience cues um, that allow you to see the world at, you, know, you know, in a more targeted way so you can do stuff like play Counter-Strike in VR. So all these things are expensive and they need to be run on a server. Right. Um, so generally what we want to do is we want to use the server side for like all the stuff like high fidelity re rendering and uh, real time production asset editing and, you know, like um, high level scene understanding, like semantic segmentation and uh, affordance prediction. But the low level uh, stuff, you know, the stuff that the client side wants to do is is the stuff that it needs to do right stuff that is close to the body so uh, sensing and body understanding and compositing and so on. So I want to talk a little bit about how. Uh, we overcome the problems that we defined here with latency and jitter. Um, so generally, our tool set should be fairly simple, right? Our tool set should be uh, built of um, things that we can do uh, by predicting, things that we can do by tricking uh, the human, and a combination of both by understanding the body. Uh, we can also, uh, you know, we can also predict some things about the body. So let's start with the first one. The body is biomechanical. Um, which means, uh, you know, like generally as a sack of meat, I, I tend to be continuous. If I'm moving my hand somewhere, um, it will keep going for the next few milliseconds. So uh, we can do body tracking um, and we can expect the body tracking to be persistent, um, let's say 20 milliseconds in the future, 40 milliseconds in the future. So that allows us to gain some gap over, you know, the network bandwidth. Um, we can also uh, predict saccades, and this is work that has been done, uh, you know, by Rachel Albert, now Rachel Brown, uh, in 2017s. We know actually that um, saccadic suppression is fairly forgiving, so we can uh, imagine or we can predict where a person is going to be looking, and then have them, um, uh, you know, like have have the the area being rendered there be more detailed, right? That's a way to overcome some of our problems. Um, the thing is, we also have some some areas that are um, 
that are untouched right now. So one of my favorite examples to give in VR conferences typically is that hand-based EMG can pick up muscle activations um, about 50, 50 milliseconds before motion. And that is, as far as I know, completely unexploited right now, right? So uh, we already know that someone is going to press a button 50 milliseconds before they actually go and press that button. So why are we reading the controllers? That's kind of boring. We really should be reading um, the muscle activations. Um, and there's a bunch of ad technology as well that is correlated with, you know, intent to buy <laughs> um, that allowed allows us to imagine what or, or like predict where a user will be going or what what they intend to do. And all of that should be useful uh, when we aim to do some prediction. Um, and this is my last slide um, because I know we're over time. Uh, I I sort of want to give us, you know, like a framework to think about the problem um, of latency and jitter, right? We we need to have um, we need to have some framework to understand um, where humans are headed, you know, physically, uh, and where humans are are headed mentally, and we need to use the rest of our tool set to uh, begin imagining uh, or begin predicting, um, you know, what what we can save in terms of of compute uh, between the network and the user, uh, and that's it. I'm not sure I have time for, for questions because I think I, I'm at 25 minutes. So we might skip some of this and go directly to the panel. I don't know. Guys, tell me what you think.